welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good morning. This is Sister Marisha Weber, and I'm the guest host of I Thought You'd Like to Know show. And my special guest today is Chris Riley. He hails from Washington, D.C. area and writes and speaks about Christian bioethics and responses to technology. And today he has agreed to speak about his recent article in the new Oxford Review, Social Media and the Decline of Human Reason. Thank you for coming on the show, Chris. No, thank you very much for having me. Well, how are you and your family doing um, during this shelter-in-place situation that we find ourselves? Uh, we're doing well. We're doing well. I I, uh, I spend a lot of time at home, so uh, that's that's helpful. It's not too much of a change of routine, but um, you know, it's it's uh, my family grew up uh, basically waiting all year for April Fool's Day, and unfortunately, this year is. It's not quite as much fun as as it might have been. Yeah, my goodness, it's so true. Yes, well, here um, I'm I'm a religious sister of mercy, and um, go to daily mass has been quite an adjustment for me to live stream mass on a daily basis, and yet it's really mm-hmm. helped me appreciate, you know, the the great gift we have in our faith that the ancient tradition of spiritual communion. Certainly was aware of it, but now to really Embrace that experience, the fact that as I am viewing this Mass or even could be reading the readings of the Mass and make a will choice to invite our Lord into my heart and soul, that that's really real. And I have then received him in the Eucharist. That Our Lord has no boundaries and has no limitations. He's eternal. Um, so that's that's been, I think, a, a powerful experience for so many of us, I, I know. Um, and I think maybe I'd like to begin by praying for an end to this pandemic, because we know so many are being affected worldwide. So let's begin. Lord God, pour out your love and care upon the sick, upon those who care for them, and all those affected by the coronavirus. Grant eternal rest to all who have died. Well, Chris, what I'd like to begin with is maybe just ask you, how is it that you first became interested in bioethics and technology? Uh, basically, I, I started out um, being involved with uh, with some advocacy groups, uh, worked at, at one organization uh, for pro-life anti-abortion um, work. And that uh, that led me to, to wanting to have a, a better uh, both theological and also um, you know, scientific or technical understanding of bioethics. Um, within bioethics and, and the issues that are associated with that, such as uh, in vitro fertilization or uh, embryonic stem cell research, uh, it all comes down to, in a lot of ways, the domination that we have over each other and over nature through technology. And so that has led me to more of an exploration of technology in general. Um, There's a lot that the church and uh, recent popes have had to say about technology, but I think there's there's a long way we can go in terms of really developing a theology of technology and how that fits in our uh, our understanding of what is an ancient tradition. Well, I, I thank you and others like you who really are are um, following the mandate of the church right from the very early days. Um, of the need to evangelize and need to become familiar with the technology to speak into it with the voice of Christ. Um, you know, it's interesting that you, you mentioned a domination by technology. Um, in your article, you speak of technology as um, dominating a society, extensively controlling and controlled by technology. Um, I found it very interesting also you suggest that we're in a culture of a new age of technology, of course, but that in several ways 
history is repeating itself. I thought, wow, that's a very interesting statement, repeating itself, even though all this new technology. Can you give us your historical perspective on this phenomenon? Sure. Um, I think uh, in, in talking about technology, there's there's too much emphasis a lot of times on uh, on so-called revolutions that we've had in technical, uh, industrial, or scientific knowledge, um, and also on the intellectual tradition uh, coming from Enlightenment philosophers in the 17th and 18th centuries. We tend to focus a lot on the Enlightenment and on modern science. Um, I think really uh, my perspective is that the, the major turn in attitudes toward technology came in the 12th century. Um, uh, a lot of people aren't aware we think the Middle Ages as being kind of a, a dead period as far as technology yes. and innovation go. <laughs> um, but in the 12th century, there was actually kind of a medieval industrial revolution. There was uh, development of windmills and, and water mills, um, new agricultural methods, and a lot of this came out of the monasteries. Um, they were focused heavily on, on the idea of work through manual labor, uh, self-sufficiency of the community. Um, so they, were, they both had time and also the, the focus on, on innovation of the technologies they were using. Um, at the same time, there was also development uh, of uh, what's called millenarianism, um, which is the expectation that the end of the world is near at hand. Um, you know, we, we talk about apocalyptic um, perspectives these days, and it's actually it's similar, but but at the same time, it's you know the 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 whole point of millenarianism was actually to um, expect kind of a, a new age in in the world in human history. Um, that's very different from the apocalypse and, and the second coming of Christ. Um, the the major figure in that was Joaquin of Fiore, who who he developed a model of three ages in in history. And it's interesting that we still kind of focus on that use of three different ages in the way that we think of the world. Um, and and millenarianism, you know, can, can you spell that? I think you know some of us might not be as familiar with that term. That would be a, a, an interesting one to to look up a little bit further. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's crucial, I think, for understanding uh, today's technology. And uh, the reason is is that like uh, like with Joaquin, he he believed in this this kind of this this age in history, this third age of the Holy Spirit, where we would have a, a reign of freedom other than law. Um, and you think about today's kind of radical individualism. Um, he believed that we would truly understand God completely uh, as opposed to um, understanding God only after we die in eternal life. Um, it's very similar to, uh, to a lot of the, the millenarian ways that we think about technology and progress today, kind of this transcendent reality acting in history. Um, today, humanity, in a lot of sense, no longer drives the technology. Um, our cars drive us. Uh, yeah. Computers think for us. Um, the Internet creates reality for us. Um, and, and also, in, in our new technology, uh, the tools and the machines are, are no longer visible. Uh, we use yeah. cell phone apps. Uh, virtual reality and artificial intelligence are becoming more important. Um, even even robots, um, you see the robot, but you don't really understand how it's working or why it's able to talk to you in a conversation of tone. Um, so it's, it's in, a, in a lot of ways, the millennial um, ideas and the idea of uh, creating kind of this uh, world in which technology is basically equal to eschatology, uh, where the uh, the final age of the world, the final wonderful world where Francis Bacon said we have the relief of man's estate, um, is a is a world where practical issues are essentially abolished and and we can uh, move forward in kind of this new Garden of Eden that we create by ourselves. 
Yeah, I, I think very much what you're saying, that technology is no longer something external. You know, I'm experiencing this, and I hear families experiencing this, um, but mostly, you know, those, are, those of us who aren't millennials and haven't, you know, taught classes over Zoom and all of that and sharing PowerPoint slides, but, you know, you just can't jump on the computer and it goes through the, com- the instructions for you. You know, you've got to hit and miss or you're, you're contacting IT. And so there is this way in which is somehow out there you're supposed to be able to know how to do this, and yet you're kind of trying to follow it rather than you're used to having, you know, a tool on the outside that you see and touch and feel and, and have some understanding before you, you engage in it. And it's at a very different time right now, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yes. When, when, you, you, when you mentioned um, Pope Francis, I mean, excuse me, I think it was more St. John Paul II, that's who it was, that um, he, he observed man lives in fear of the products of his genius. Um, you know, what do you think he was predicting in this statement? I, I think the, the key concept for St. John Paul II was alienation. Um, and he talked about that as a reversal of means and ends. Um, normally we think of, you know, with instrumental rationality, we think of, you know, using or coming up with appropriate means for particular end or objective or 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 uh, something we want to attain, um, but uh, for him the the means of technology and production actually start to determine what's important to us in this world, um, and he was focused a lot on on an orientation to truth. Uh, truth is not just the result of reasoning, but it's also especially needed in reasoning. Uh, he had a quote in uh, Veritatis Splendor where he said, authentic freedom is never freedom from the truth, but always freedom in the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But in you know, you know, an alienated society, alienated persons, uh, we've really lost our connection with the truth, which is you know, really our, our destiny uh, in, in the vision of God in eternal life, not uh, in this world. Yeah, yeah. Almost like truth. You know, it's, it's, it's not just something out there, but it really requires us to participate in it, to experience it. We have to, you know, almost develop a shared understanding and a recognition of it. It's very, very real, but unless we, you know, engage in an experience of it, it's hard for us to say that it's truth with a capital T versus a relativistic truth, which is really nothing more than my own opinion, which is evolving so rapidly in this technological age. That's very true. Um, yeah, I think uh, Pope Francis has uh, has done a lot, uh, particularly in La Si. Um, a lot of people see that encyclical as being mainly about environmentalism, but he also talked a lot about what he calls a technocratic paradigm, uh, which is basically the idea that uh, instrumental and technological reason uh, have become kind of an ideology, that uh, calculative thinking, um, what we're, we typically would see in technological production, uh, using and controlling things, is actually the way that we're, we're relating to each other, that we're dominating each other um, in a way that, uh, that uses and controls. So, so again, you, you know, you 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 brought up some of these social media platforms where they are controlling what really gets disseminated to the users um, in a way that I just had not appreciated. I mean, I I use technology, but some of the things you've described in the algorithms and things like that were just fascinating. Um, could you share a little bit about that from your article? Uh, sure. I, um, you know, uh, Facebook, particularly, and, and I focus the article on Facebook and, and in general, but certainly this works with uh, most of the branded social media platforms that we use. Um, but they did determine uh, through these algorithms uh, which posts are delivered and at what frequency in in the news feeds, which is the, the list of posts that you see sequentially um, on your uh, on your Facebook page. Algorithms are basically uh, mathematical formulas that assign numeric scores to uh, to each of the posts. 
and uh, they measure uh, things like uh, the viewer responses to the posts, uh, the design of the posts, uh, content quality, which they they see, you know, quality is kind of in, in their subjective idea of whether or not, uh, for example, a, a post um, will have linked content that uh, resembles the information that's on the website that it's linked to. Um, they'll also, you know, screen for supposedly hateful or politically offensive messages. Um, and they use the algorithms to display posts that have high numeric scores um, and that attract uh, either uh, like, like when a person clicks on like with a post or share. Um, they, they favor those posts and make those posts show up in your friends' uh, news feeds more often. Um, actually, a lot of people don't know that on, on average, only about 4% of your posts um, show up in any one friend's uh, news feed. Uh, yeah, 4%. That was such a low number. When I read that, I thought, oh, my gosh, that is yeah. incredible. And so they're inserting, and social media platforms are inserting really what they want us to receive through right. this algorithm process that you're describing, um, and what you know, as a bioethicist, um, what what is that doing to you know some of the Christian faith beliefs and the you know eternal truths and the dignity of the human person, and what we're trying to do you know to evangelize on this platform which has become you know an ordinary marketplace that persons really need to reach out into in order to also get um the voice of Christ um better known uh, to some when Jesus said you know go make disciples of all the nations for us now the highways and byways of that are certainly um cyberlinks right right yeah, I, I um, you know, I, I focus a lot on how authentic human reason, uh, the full uh, level of human reason, not just instrumental, um, is really important for evangelization. It's important for us to get the truths of uh, of Christianity out to um, others, to uh, to be involved in apologetics, to explain and defend the faith with others. Um, and human reason really requires us to be able to not only uh, answer uh, in a logical way, but also contemplate the big questions and, and also be aware and uh, speak within the context of the truths of divine revelation. So um, with, with social media, uh, for example, um, there's some design elements of it that actually cause us to act quickly, kind of uh, bring us into uh, using the media in, in a habitual and almost addictive way. Um, for example, uh, just subtle things like uh, a single click on, uh, on a button will allow you to, to engage with content, with somebody's post, with just a, a like or follow or share um, action without any further thought or reflection or response. Um, also, you know, they, they enhance the speed in which you act by, for example, when you submit a comment, uh, if you hit enter, it immediately goes through uh, rather than searching out and clicking a separate send button. And these are small things, but they, they add up very quickly to cause this, uh, this experience of habitual action and, and very fast, um, unthinking uh, behavior that, that moves you through posts um, and allows, the, allows Facebook, basically, to gather data on what it is that you like or don't, which posts are most interesting, and what tastes and interests each person has uh, in the information, and, and this is what they use to uh, to feed the advertisers, um, yeah. <laughs> in order, you know, in order to be profitable. Yeah, and and what this does to rational and sustained discourse, you know, it, it, what you're describing, I hear, you know, uh, um, uh, creating a polarization of views where an extreme positive and an extreme negative. Which, of course, just as you're saying, undermines healthy debate and 
we we know those of us who you know are rational things we know that we're a community can potentially share and maybe then update or modify a perspective by learning from an opposing argument then something you know can successfully be negotiated between those extreme perspectives we come to better understand one another and realize that though we have some diff- differences in more ways we are similar and, and and this this kind of polarization of this algorithmic process of calling out what um, you know is not kind of middle ground or one side getting to know another is really really doing some not so helpful things to what we would call dialogue true authentic dialogue exactly yeah um, you know Facebook is a, is a for-profit entity uh, that's that's their really only focus. We think about it as you know basically it's a free um, opportunity to communicate with the world and communicate with our friends. Um, but but basically the the information that we're putting into Facebook is um, essentially uh, material input uh, data that uh, Facebook is able to use uh, to create value. Um, basically by taking that information, processing it, analyzing it, uh, and then giving very sophisticated analysis and targeting ability to its advertisers so that they can target their advertisements exactly to the right people who will respond to their advertisements either by buying or by, uh, you know, by responding or trying to gain more information or go to the website. Now, Chris, you describe... Uh, this naive herding process. What, what what is that? Can you say a little more about this naive herding and all that you've been talking to us about? Sure. Uh, naive herding is, is well when, when when somebody is exposed when a user on uh, on Facebook is exposed to messages that have new information. Um, usually, it's it's information that's repeatedly displayed to them because the algorithms push that kind of information to them as being something that individual is specifically interested in or, or agrees with. Um, and it's also sent from the same small group of authors or shared by the same small group of people. So what, what's going to happen is that user who sees that is likely to discount information as being biased, whether they agree with it or not, rather than learning from it. Um, also, the posts that they see are generally so polarized uh, and either positively or negatively about an issue, they, uh, they undervalue the information that they see in the arguments because they don't trust the accuracy and the reasoning skills of the other people. Um, so naive herding, what happens is uh, herding meaning H-E-R-D-I-N-G, like forming a cattle herd at a ranch. Um, the users discount the authority of recent messages that they see, um, but for some reason they consider the information and the messages of the earliest participants in the debate as if they were most authoritative. Um, so a, a group of users tends to trust and share and, and click the like button for the same original posts that are just as biased really as any other post because those persons were also influenced by other people's perspectives and the scarcity yeah. of accurate information. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the, the mob or the mass thinking where you become more entrenched if you keep hearing the same mantra, you know, time and time again. It kind of narrows even your openness or your even um, thinking, let me think about this a little bit more. Um, which certainly would make it difficult to to build a, a community of of, of dialogue, um, right. as, as you're describing that naive hurting. Yeah. Now, Chris, you're, you you've also talked about right brain, left brain. Um, tell us a little bit about how the left brain works, a little bit about how the right brain works, and how this fits in to some of what you're te- talking about with regards to um, technology. And um, you know how that really fits in with Christian bioethics. Sure. Um, Ian McGilchrist uh, wrote an article for um, it was a report through the American Enterprise Institute called "How Our Brains Make the World," 
And it's the first time I saw this where he, he explained that the, the, the major difference in the functions of the left and right hemispheres of the brain have to do with attention. Um, so the, the right brain gives attention more to the wider picture, uh, manages ambiguity or, or uncertainty that we might experience, and also can think uh, more metaphorically uh, about about our world that we experience. Where the left brain is uh, re really tries to uh, use undivided concentration, so it allows us to focus on an object or or a goal or an action in a uh, in a concentrated way. Um, attention is crucial to reasoning. So uh, if you think about it, attention is what helps us give meaning to what an object or a goal really is, uh, including when we ourselves are the object. For example, uh, I use this in the uh, in the article. Um, a, a somebody, you know, if you take a a ball that's stitched together, uh, it may not have much meaning. But if you, when you pay attention to it and you pay attention to the use of it in a particular context, it becomes a baseball, uh, mm -hmm. and you hit it with a bat and you play a game. On social media, uh, you can see uh, a person that's displaying a selfie, which is like a picture of yourself that you take. On social media, uh, you, your identity becomes something new. Uh, it directs uh, the other's attention to a specific characteristic that you might desire that they would see, such as being fun or respected or attractive. Um, and it does it often in a one-dimensional way. So in a way, it, it directs our attention in a left-brain manner, um, but takes our attention away from reasoning about the overall uh, character of that person and uh, a more meaningful communication with that person uh, through the social media. So right brain is where we kind of understand some of the data that we've focused on and puts a context on it that allows us then to come to, you know, a better understanding of of how this can be used or how it is being used. Um, where is it? So it's it's not just looking at nuts and bolts that are sitting out there and we're just playing with a couple of the same nuts and bolts. It's we're trying to put the pieces together to create something new or something more comprehensive or cohesive. And if we're um, kind of moved by this media to not use our right brain as much, we are actually using less of our intellective capacity, that executive function of the brain that um, God has given us. We're the only creatures that God created that allows us to pause, ponder, reflect, and create with our mind and in our hands and, and working together something new that's expansive where this kind of left brain focal technology keeps us more narrow-minded, so to speak. Is, is, is that kind of what I hear you saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, right brain, you know, left brain uh, attention gives us the opportunity to concentrate and 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 use more uh, more guided logic, whereas the the right brain attention gives us more of an awareness of what's going on, say, say in our our own intellect and our own emotions, and also what's going on, how that's happening in other people that we might be communicating with, and in our social and physical environment. So it, it makes a difference in, in being able to understand uh, things like symbols and, and tone of speech and metaphors, um, which which in many ways indicate the truth about something uh, even more than a purely verbal or logical or written content. And what do you think this is happening on, um, you know, Christian evangelization? Um, and and what might we try to do in light of you know this massive um, cybernetic machinery that is hard to create you know different pathways for because these are, are fairly well established and um, worked on 
regularly to be maintained in this certain kind of one lane pathway rather than a more divergent, um, you know, new landscape, wider horizon pathway. Um, how, how are we to, to navigate this in order to really um, make better use of this marketplace to um, bring the face of Christ? Uh, um, yeah, you know, the, the Apostle Peter uh, says in in, uh, in one Peter, he says, "Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have." So, you know, evangelization, apologetics are, are really a lot of of what we are as and, and our identity as Christians. Um, none of it can really happen unless we really re- reestablish the authority of reason in social communications. Um, so one area is, is certainly is trying to increase the ability to build intentional communities, communities that have strong identities, uh, have a purpose, and, and dialogue in a rational way. Um, the algorithms in Facebook really, you know, they re- restrict the delivery of most posts. They ignore the relevance of a post to the purpose of a community or a group of people. Um, the news feeds display the messages sequentially so they're not grouped as conversations, uh, so they have random topics or intentions and friend types. Um, so what we can do really is, uh, first of all, uh, is focus on what Pope Francis called an attitude of care uh, now, he was talking about the, the wider environment, but he was also talking in, in regard to technology. It's, it's an attitude where uh, we have more contemplation and reverence for, uh, for the meaning of our environment, uh, greater gratitude, um, communion with nature, both outside and within ourselves. Um, pope Benedict XVI also, he had an address uh, when he was, uh, before he was pope, uh, called Truth and Freedom, um, where he, he talked about uh, a new need of reason that is accompanied by faith. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically he was going back to the, uh, the Greek idea of logos, where uh, it's not just logic and calculation and strategy, but social reasoning, uh, coming up with arguments and debates and reasoning among ourselves, especially verbal, um, that allows us to access truth. Um, for Christians, uh, one of the things that, that really I think is, is going to be necessary is uh, either finding a social media platform that allows us to do that as a community and, and invite others in, of course, to the dialogue. Um, there's not much out there that's available. There's, you know, there, there's a new platform called Mastodon that allows uh, a person, anyone, to create an account and then build a social network on their own uh, internet server that allows them to moderate the behavior of users, also determine uh, which other networks or other communities um, are connected to. So it's it's one way. It's, it's, an, it's an indication of the technology that's available out there where I, I think Christians need their own platform. Um, I, I think we need our own uh, opportunity to build a community that uh, focuses on uh, rational communication and dialogue um, and makes that possible. Um, you know, Twitter is, is talking about doing something similar possibly uh, through a, they call it a decentralized uh, network called Blue Sky, uh, but we haven't seen really uh, what direction that's going to take and whether that might be useful for these purposes. You know, I'm, as you're speaking, it makes me think that, you know, in God's permissive will that we have this time of, you know, shelter in place and this, and this horrible pandemic that, um, you know, we know that he's present with us and um, all that he does will be turned unto good, even though there's going to be some suffering and for many individuals that we already heard of, you know, um, death. Thank goodness for our eternal life. But as you're speaking, it makes me um, just reflect on the number of Catholic um, streams that have become available, the number of Catholic channels and podcasts and social media apps 
that are becoming free to persons to access. They're trying to put out more, you know, Christian movies for adults, for children, for families to watch in a way that we had not seen before this pandemic. And as painful as this is in many real ways, physically, emotionally, uh, financially, um, in, in all ways, there's this little light of persons turning, you know, makes me think of the, the, the misery of mankind converging with the mercy of God as we're now trying to expand beyond this single channel of, of data and just memes or selfies um, to things of, of substance, of things of truth and, and universal um, principles that are, are rooted in our Christian faith. Um, I've never heard so much of that being uh, promoted, being made available as I have in these past two weeks. And I'm, I'm just edified and encouraged by that. Do you think that this might be, in God's permissive will, a little window that he's offering us to extend and expand the, the platform in which we are able to walk through this marketplace of cyber networking? I, I do. Um, I have. I think there's some limitations to it, but I, I, I do believe that, that you know that we we need to be very positive about um, what the technology is allowing us to do and giving us the opportunity to share um, information, teachings, uh, motivation, uh, inspiration uh, through the internet and through social media. There's no question. It's been incredibly valuable for that, and particularly in a crisis like this. Um, w one of the, the limitations I see with it and something that, that, you know, I guess I should put it as, a, as an opportunity for us to do better is um, one is, is really the difficulty with the Internet in general in terms of identifying where authority lies. Um, you know, we, we have certainly documents uh, available to us through, uh, like, the Vatican website, um, we have teachings um, provided through the USCCB and, and other Catholic entities that have clear authority. Uh, but we also have an awful lot of information and uh, explanation and apologetics out there that, um, you know, it's difficult to tell whether the individual has the, uh, has the education or has the um, you know, the background or, or even the backing of the church and, and some things that are, are shared. So I think that's that's an important area where we, we it's going to require, in a way, uh, a more restricted communication or more restricted um, universe of communication so that we can be sure of the authority behind it. Um, but it also, you know, with with greater authority and greater indication of an authority behind a communication, it actually allows us to spread that information widely and more securely and hopefully overcome people's um, mistrust or, or difficulty in accepting um, those communications as representing the truth. Yeah. I think you make a very, very important point. Yes, um, it, 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 it's, it's um, a very significant point that the need for you know, true evangelization, and that's that's the tension I think we uh, we have, you know, throughout all of of Christian history, and in in a little bit of a new, unique way now, and yet, as you said earlier in your paper, that somehow this is history repeating itself, just with some you know different platforms. So I, I appreciate um, you know that caveat that you've you know offered us. I think as we're coming close to the the you know the end of um, our interview today, as you share with us some you know fascinating um, bits of information that you have in your new article, which I recommend to to persons. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the right brain and the left brain, and um, you're inviting us to try to get more of that dynamic fullness. Um, to be more encompassing. And I think one of the last lines in your paper is that um, that dynamic fullness of our world and the 
all-encompassing focus of the right and the left brain in harmony. That's what we would strive to do. And really, that objective is the way and the light of Christ. Um, and so um very much appreciate your your time and your insights and um you know be very interested and also you you said you're writing more about problems on this instrumental ra- rationality and the role in modern technology um can you share a little bit with us as to what is up and coming that we can also look forward to in some of your future pieces sure uh yeah, they're they're not uh, specifically on uh, on social media or that uh, social technology, um, but uh, I, I'm focusing a lot on this this uh, issue of instrumental reasoning, um, which is basically like I was saying before, is the you know, basically choosing the means that are considered to be suitable for obtaining an end or a goal. Uh, a lot of times with, with instrumental reasoning, or almost all the time, we assume that the end of the reasoning is somehow chosen through some other process, you know, whether it's deduction or consensus or intuition or revelation. Um, so when, when someone claims that their instrumental reasoning is objective and mechanically precise, uh, they're, they're actually demanding that we accept not only the criteria that they prefer for determining what the appropriate means are for attaining the goal, but also that we agree on the uh, on the end and also supposedly uh, objective and universally valid methods of measuring those criteria, measuring whether those means are appropriate for the end. Um, and, and so to, to get out of the abstract, uh, basically I'm, I'm looking at how instrumental rationality, that outlook, can actually be incorporated in technology so that you have a really a material structure of the technology or the device that forces us to think in a certain way. Um, and, uh, you know, as Pope Francis said, technology tends to absorb everything into its ironclad logic. Um, I, I think it's something that, that can be explored a lot more in regard to specific technologies, not just social media, but also biotechnologies like IF or uh, one article that I have that will be coming out in, I think, November in uh, quarterly um, is in regard to um, the way that brain-machine interfaces are commodified. Um, which is uh, brain-machine interfaces are basically devices that allow two-way communication and direction between the brain and a computerized device. Um, so they're fascinating in themselves. There's also a way in which they're structured as a technology that causes us to, uh, to be uh, thinking in a certain way and causes the users of that technology to tend to think of um, both their actions and also... Uh, their identity, what they think of themselves, uh, in a very instrumental way. Wow, that sounds fascinating. You know that Lenacker um, quarterly that you're mentioning is the is the Catholic Medical Association um, medical journal. Um, some excellent articles, and that's we look forward to being able to um, read that as well. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for your willingness to come on the show and um, offer us a, a fascinating interview. And I encourage persons to read your article, Social Media and the Decline of Human Reason, the new Oxford Review. And if persons wanted to try to get a hold of that, is there a link that is also possible for them to download or, is, or um, would they um, need to get the, the journal itself, Chris? Yeah, it's it's not uh, publicly available. Um, every once in a while, uh, especially over a period of time, the, the articles will be available for for public use if you don't have a subscription. But like most journals, it's um, it requires a subscription uh, at this time to be to read the article. Well, of course, and that makes it all the better that we've had this chance to speak with you and um, you know and glean from some of the nuggets that. Um, you've been able to share from your paper. Well, we thank you very much. Um, Stay healthy, stay well. Thank you to our listeners, and blessed rest of Lent. So until 
next time. This is Sister Marisha Weber, guest host of this show, and um, my guest um, interviewee here was Chris Riley. God bless you all. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.